Hello everybody, my name is Cindy Goulder. I'm an ecological landscape and garden designer here in Brooklyn. I work on residential gardens, community gardens, public gardens, educational gardens, natural areas as well. And uh, um, I'm here today in the Poplar Street Community Garden, which is the, my community garden. I am a member of this garden. Um, and my, I'm giving a workshop today on the subject of spring care of pollinator perennials. Now this workshop was supposed to take place at a garden, a community garden in the South Bronx, um, but because of social distancing and so forth, um, we couldn't do it there. The garden there is, uh, we, it, it, it was a, planted just a few years ago. The, the, the perennials were planted just a few years ago based on a planting plan that I had designed and the whole point was to show the members of that garden and anybody else how to take care of them. That garden, the plants were evenly spaced, evenly aged, very simple. This garden is very different. It's been here, oh, maybe 20, more than 25 years, since the 90s. Uh, plants were put in at whim. This one person brought in, in this, that one brought in that. People left, new people came in. So it's very, very full of, of many, many different kinds of plants. And not only are the people bringing them in, but, the, but some of the plants are planting themselves. Um, a little bit more about this garden. Um, it's here on the edge of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. This is, this is a wedge of land that was here, that was left over when the highway was built. We have some, it doesn't have any sidewalk or anything. It's not a conventional streetscape garden. Um, we have uh, some, some apple trees in this garden that we believe were here from before the time uh, of the BQE. Otherwise, when I came to the garden in 2001, this white pine was 10 feet tall. Those Siberian elms were about 15 feet tall. I'm just sorry we didn't take them out at the time when we could, uh, because they are not only invasive, but they're a big problem for us because they, they, yes, they create shade, but the bigger problem is that they take up all the water from everything else. And we've lost a lot of plants and had to be, be watering almost daily or sometimes daily in the middle of summer because of those trees. I wanna tell you that we have about about 20 members in, the, in this garden. The number changes from year to year. Um, the deal is to join this garden, you got to want to help take care of the whole of the garden and work together with everyone else. Those roses that were planted 25 years ago, somebody's got to take care of them. And, if, 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 and same with, for that matter, all our fruit trees and uh, the hedge over here. You got to keep it neat. Um, and then, of course, the, the perennials. Uh, so people who join the garden just find what's most interesting to them and, and help out with that. We do have plots, uh, but not enough for everybody. And uh, people understand that the, the plots come second. And we do try to accommodate people. Uh, if there's not enough, we do try to accommodate people who don't have plots. And, but some people don't want them. Okay, we're gonna start by cutting back the dead tops of the perennials from last year. Used to be, uh, the strategy was to cut them all back in the fall, that for neatness sake, and also to get a jump on spring, to have let less to do in the spring. But it has been realized lately that the insects and the birds use these dead stems in the winter long for habitat, for food, uh, for protection, um, for nest building materials too. So we leave them. Um, in, in a situation in the city where you've got a small garden, uh, if you, you, you can, it, it's okay to thin them out a little bit, to make them a little bit neater. Um, but and another thing to do is if you must cut them back, you take all your trimmings and you stack them up like these so that the insects can get at them. The 
asters and goldenrods and other uh, daisy-like composite family plants uh, are, are much useful to the, uh, are useful to, to the bees and, and other creatures. They're, they're sturdy uh, and uh, they don't rot as easily. Um, otherwise, think of uh, shrubs like elderberry, raspberry, um, and, and for that matter, um, hydrangeas have hollow or pithy stems that are useful to the creatures. So, like I said, if you must cut them back, stack them up somewhere so they can be used. When we cut back in the spring, we wait until the temperatures are in the 50s. That's so that the insects can get the most use out of, the, out of their habitat, out of their protected circumstances. Um, and we cut back a little at a time, just to make sure there's still stuff left uh, as before the insects um, come alive in the spring. Okay, so uh, let's cut back. Um, the members have already started. A lot, of the, a lot of the plants have already been cut back, but um, I'm, in fact, I'm gonna show you. The idea is, ideally, is to cut back to, you know, six inches or even more, like right here. Um, if you're in a place that, where neatness doesn't count, don't cut back at all. You look at that plant over there, um, the, the, the plant is growing up right around what, what was there last year, and that seems to be really the best way. But like I said, if you're in a city garden, you want neatness, that may not work. So um, what was here before, we had very tall growing plants in here, this is um, uh, daisy-like plants, bee balm, monardas, a um, uh, lot, of, lot of plants I can't think of right now. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, we're going to do some cutting back right now. As I said, the, the members have already done a good deal of it. Um, this garden we call our insectary herb garden. Uh, it is for insects. A lot of the plants were put in that are attractive to bees and butterflies uh, and other insects. Um, but also we put in plants that are useful to human beings too. Uh, Monarda, bee balm, uh, is a wonderful tea, makes a wonderful tea. It's in the mint family. Um, uh, hyssop, anise hyssop is in here. Um, and uh, many others I can't think of right now. So this is a grass. Uh, it's called uh, switchgrass. Um, and um, while this, the grasses don't attract pollinators, they're wind pollinated, they are still very much habitat and very often host plants for uh, butterflies and moths. So I'm just gonna take my shears. Now when you follow me, when you do this, be sure to sharpen your shears. Um, and I'm just cutting it back. I suppose if you have a machete or a scythe, you could use those. And this, by the way, is going to be very good for uh, like a mulch over over uh, vegetable plant seeds. So we're gonna save it. There were other, this is another one of the, one of the plants that we're just gonna cut back to there. Here's an, and let's see what else I got. Well, this one we can just take out. <laughs> and like that, but something else I can point out too is it doesn't have to be totally clean, in fact, we can break up this to be part of the mulch, to be, to be decomposing into new soil for the garden. Uh, the leaves especially, but also the stems. I can tell you that what, what this is, that is some uh, flowering garlic uh, that I took out a lot of flowering garlic in this, in this uh, garden because it was taking over, but this was so much in the way of the, 
of the switchgrass that I left it. Um, another plant I see here is Queen Anne's Lace. It's not native to the region, uh, but it's a very attractive to um, bees and especially surfing flies, which are bee mimics, bee lookalikes. Uh, and, and so I do, we do. Uh, I like to grow it and so do many members of the garden. Uh, um, I will tell you that out in Seattle, uh, which is of course a, a different hardiness zone, uh, Queen Anne's Lace is considered an invasive plant. So um, maybe 20 years from now, it'll be a problem here. For now, uh, we deal with it. We, we make it for, available for people and, and for the insects. Okay, well, I've ta told you a little bit about our insectary herb garden. Right across the path is this area we call Robin's Border. It was named for one of the founders of the garden who had put in lilies, peonies, and many other traditional garden plants. Uh, we have since supplemented it with native plants and uh, herbs for, or for people. Um, but you may have noticed this is bronze fennel, which, by the way, is uh, very much uh, liked by many insects, uh, in including um, the surfeit flies and some swallowtails. Uh, but you'll see it's starting to self-sow. And so I'm, this down here, here's some down here, and here's some here. We don't need it in front of the garden. It's going to grow tall. So uh, I'm going to try to dig it out. And I'm going to use, this is called a hori hori knife, or uh, it's Japanese. Uh, people sometimes call it a soil knife. Uh, I use it instead of a trowel. Uh, if this doesn't work, we'll go out and shovel, because this is very, very deep-rooted. Okay. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope, I'm going to get a shovel. Uh, I'm back with a shovel, and I've also got a bucket for collecting stuff we remove so we're not making piles of it and have to come back and forth for it. We'll take that to the compost. There. Now I got under it there. All right. Ooh. Oh, that's a part of it. I didn't get it all. I told you it had deep roots. Here it is. There's the rest of it. That's the root. Fortunately, some other removals are easier than this. Okay, and now this lovely phlox can grow all the way to the edge and it'll grow this tall and not have that in the way. Okay, to be clear, what the cutback was about was all the dead stems of perennials and some shrubs, dead wood, that we wanted to um, get out of the way. Uh, and um, it's indiscriminate. It's whether you like the plants or not, you leave them through the winter and then you cut them back in the spring. Now, obviously, if there's a plant you really don't want in your garden, you can take that out in the, in the fall, winter, anytime you want. What I just did now in taking out the fennel, fennel is a wonderful plant. It's just that that, and it was coming up, but well, that was not dead, that was new growth. And the problem with that one is that it was in the wrong place. It had self, seeded itself in. So that's why I took it out. And if you look, here's another one, there's more there, and there's more there, and there's more there. So we can decide, do we want them all? And if we do, that's fine. But if they're in the way, or if, there's a, if they're going to uh, uh, come out compete other plants that we want to have, that's when we take it out. While we're here, I'm pointing out there's a lot of this, which is called rose campion. It has a very, very hot pink flower in, in June. 
And then there's another plant in here, which we call Coreopsis, um, and it has big yellow flowers flowering at the same time. There's a lot of this rose campion. Um, one would be tempted to take some of it out. It's all self-sown, but we're gonna wait until it flowers and, the, and flowers with the yellow uh, Coreopsis. And then we'll think about, first of all, letting it go to seed, collecting the seed, and then removing the plants that are, that are excessive. The plant is um, it's, it's a, what's called a short-lived perennial. Uh, it's just that, it may live a few years, but to compensate for the fact that it doesn't live very long, it's, it does a lot of self-sowing, just like annuals. Um, I just wanna point out, you're seeing a lot of the grape hyacinth muscari in here. Um, the, those plants, the early blooming plants are really important for the pollinators. I saw two bumblebee queens on, on these guys, on this plant uh, throughout the garden yesterday. Um, it's really important to have flowering as early as possible. So one thing to be thinking as you, as you work on your garden in spring, think about what other plants you could be putting in that do flower at this time of year. Okay, uh, we're back in Robin's Border, and I happen to notice there's a lovely patch here of Monarda, bee balm, sometimes called the wild bergamot, but it is being, it's soon going to be taken over by the large leaves of Elecampane, which is the first one. Those leaves get very big, and you see there's more of them coming here. So rather than have have it be out competing, I'm going to dig up some of this uh, bee balm and, and put it someplace else, like maybe over there. Now this plant, as I said before, it's in the mid family, and like other plants in the mid family, it has very shallow roots. You can see here, these are little seedlings of something you take out just to make things easier to understand. And I'm going to just plant it right here. Very keep the horizontal root. And keep these little guys the little shoots. And that broke off, but that's okay because it is spring and everything else is gonna grow. So let me take a little more of it. expecting a flood. If you're going to transplant or plant anything, you have to water it in. This is dividing and transplanting. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually dig up a plant, break it apart, and then make those smaller pieces that we can then plant anywhere we want, including back where it was and other places. You have to understand that this kind of work it can, it's done in the spring, but it's, it can be done in the fall. In fact, it's better done in the fall because that's the time when plants are focused on growing roots, um, sending that photosynthate down into the roots. And then, of course, when the plants, they, plants come up at the time they're meant to. Okay, this is dividing and transplanting again. 
Okay, we're back in Robin's border again. This time I'm gonna dig up a whole plant. One that we wanna we wanna make smaller and or we wanna spread it around other places. This happens to be an aster. Um, and I can see that it's competing with another plant over here, right next to it, that is a, um, a false sunflower. So I'm just going to dig it all up. Mm -hmm. what happens okay okay well here's a section of it I didn't get it all but that's okay we want a section of it and you see we can break this apart and um, there seem to be two ways to, to divide a plant um, one is to actually pull it pull the pieces apart but if that doesn't work you really do get out a tool and saw it It'll let you know which way it wants to go. Uh -uh. Okay, so some of those roots just pulled out, others had to be sawed. And I can even make this plant smaller. You see there are different sections coming out. There's one with a tiny little root. That could be a whole big plant someday. So um, what we've done over here is we've taken out part of it. But I'm still concerned about the plant that it's running into back here. So I'm going to dig it up and move it. There you go. Okay. So this is the rest of it. You know, you think of plants like hosta, which get very, very big. At some point, you can dig them up and divide them into several, several other plants. So I've taken, I've like lifted this, I've divided it, and I'm putting back just this one part. And we'll water that in. And then we'll have, and then we'll have these other sections to, um, to plant elsewhere if we want them. Now I'm going to tell you right now that Aster this is smooth aster, and it self sows easily. And we already have too much of it in the garden, so we're not going to plant these. We'll give them away. We'll find other people who want them. We'll put them in pots, but we're not going to plant them. Um, we're here by the garden's little house. Um, it's actually a storage shed. Um, the gardeners built it a few years ago. Um, it, it was modeled after a smaller child's playhouse that had been brought here many years ago and had rotted out. And the gardener said, oh gee, we have to have our little house, but let's make it a better place for storage things. So that's how it happened. I mean, it's even got the cedar shingles and all. We love it. It's the centerpiece of the garden. But right next to it, we've got golden ragwort. This is a native plant, and here we are on April 16. It's been flowering the last few days. Uh, very easy to care for. If you, when it goes to seed, if you don't like the, the dead stems, 
you cut them off. Otherwise, you leave them. But you'll notice that it's got this lovely foliage that makes a great ground cover. So all season long, after the flowers are gone, you got this great ground cover. And here it is, another native plant, the violet, is flowering at the same time, and that too makes a lovely ground cover. Uh, some people think of it as a weed, but in this garden, we, we use it. We, it helps us fill areas that would otherwise uh, have much worse plants growing there. This garden, when I came here, there was loads of mugwort and all, all kinds of things that we didn't want. And the, the violets have helped us manage the landscape. And of course, the flowers are beautiful and it too makes a nice ground cover. We've got Lily of the Valley coming in here as well. Just starting. And uh, now if this is too patchy in the next few weeks, once the flowers have finished on the uh, golden ragwort, and for that matter, the, the, uh, the violet, we can fill in. We can just dig them up, little pieces, and fill it in. Um, you probably saw me, before I started talking about these, pull out these little seedlings. These are the smooth aster that we, I've said, mentioned we have so much of because it seeds in so readily. Um, and we do have to, in this garden, just pull them out uh, from places we don't want them. Uh, those will grow big, like the ones we did over there, we saw over there, and uh, we don't need them here. So this will be, we'll keep this just a solid um, ground cover area. And that'll be nice, without the asters. Okay, so uh, we do talk about planting at this time of year. It's not, it's not all for fall, we do do planting. Um, just for the sake of it, I'm gonna do a little different kind of planting. Here's a little piece of a, of a thyme that I had in my vegetable garden. We're gonna move it into right between these paving stones and let it spread out and fill in there so we'll have it instead of things we, plants we don't want coming in. Voila! Okay, well, I've told you a little bit about cutting back. I've told you a little bit about removal, about lifting and dividing. Those are the things we do for all kinds of perennials. But you know, we're focused now on the ones for pollinators and this garden does have a lot. I hope you got to see some of those. Um, just wanna say thank you for your attention. Um, sorry we couldn't be doing this hands-on. I would have loved to be there with you, you with the tools, me just kind of guiding you. Uh, but um, I hope you paid attention and we're, can, can take something from this to do it yourself. Thank you. <laughs>